Hello and welcome to yet another edition of What Works, What Doesn't and Why Insights from Evaluation. So in October 2020, Independent Evaluations Department published a report on ADB's um, support to public-private partnerships and the period evaluated was from 2009 to 2019. The report uh, actually assessed ADB's effectiveness in supporting PPP activities and how best it can respond to the PPP's demand in different country contexts and across key sectors. And of course, PPPs are more imperative now to minimize the negative impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on government's budget, which are already under pressure. And to speak a little bit more about the report, its key findings and recommendations, I'd like to hand over the session to Alexander Wellsteed. Uh, who is the team leader for this evaluation. Alex, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Saleha. And uh, the report was put together. It's available online. My job today is quickly to go through a quick summary of some of the message in that report to set the context for uh, the panel discussion that will follow. So very quickly, five key messages that came from the report were that ADB support for PPPs in Asia and the Pacific has delivered positive development outcomes mostly through targeted downstream investments. You, you'll see that on some of the data slides in just a moment. Secondly, that ADB's upstream PPP work was relevant, but not able to achieve much needed change to crowd in the private sector. Thirdly, on the downstream side, prioritization of ADB's risk mitigation products is crucial to address key market constraints and enhance mobilization of private capital. Fourthly, ADB's upstream work, this is advocacy in the enabling environment, has not often been well coordinated with downstream project development and financing activities. And that ADB's organizational setup is currently not well suited to deliver a holistic coordinated PPP thematic agenda and to promote quality infrastructure outcomes. So briefly, an outline of, of this five minute presentation, I'm gonna set a little bit about the, the PPP development context in Asia and Pacific, and then go into the report's main findings and briefly the recommendations that came from the report. In terms of the development context in Asia and Pacific, infrastructure deficits have emerged in many ADB DMCs due to increased urbanization, historical underinvestment and poor maintenance of existing infrastructure. PPPs are a procurement option for ADB DMCs. They are not and never have been a financing shortcut. Lack of updated sector, regulatory and policy frameworks, as well as limited institutional capacity and SOE dominance has slowed the pace of PPP investments in DMCs. The availability of finance is not the key issue for delivering PPPs. Managing and appropriately pricing project risk is a much more substantive challenge. Lastly, that the COVID-19 pandemic will increase pressures on government budgets. PPP projects in demand sensitive sectors such as transport will be adversely impacted. Going on to the main findings of the report. The report examined the full range of ADB's PPP activity. This is from what we term as pillar one. This is the advocacy. Pillar two work looking at policy work. Three, transaction advisory services, right down to the financing of PPP projects in, in pillar four. And the, the, the largest concentrations you can see on the slide, on the far right-hand side, is that ADB activity was in downstream pillar four activities. During the period of 2009 to 2018, ADB approved $22 billion worth of PPP interventions spread across 278 projects and TA interventions and comprising 10.8 billion in 66 sovereign loans and 11.1 billion in 86 non-sovereign facilities. Five countries accounted for 65% of ADB's PPP-related project approvals. During 2009 to 2018, India at 21% took the largest share, very quickly followed by Indonesia and the Public Republic of China at 14%, Philippines and Bangladesh at 8% each. 
By region, Southeast Asia and South Asia had the largest share at 33% and 31% respectively. In terms of sectors, energy PPPs dominated at 41% of ADB approvals, followed by finance interventions, water and other urban infrastructure services at 14%. In terms of development performance, so we're looking at success for both the sovereign and non-sovereign side of the bank's activities. Main findings were that on the sovereign side, now sovereign side projects span the whole range from very early upstream advocacy work all the way down to uh, financing of government-led infrastructure projects, so pillar four activities as well. The success rate was 65% scoring particularly well in terms of relevance to DMC development goals. Non-sovereign PPP projects focused on downstream financing, often at a much later stage of project development, performed particularly well. An average success rate for PSOD-led projects was 91%. In terms of main findings on development results, Sovereign-based policy loans improved PPP policies and processes in key DMCs such as Bangladesh, India, Mongolia, Nepal, China, and also Philippines in that number. Less than half of the sovereign projects contributed, however, to maintenance of government fiscal discipline, and that for both ADB sovereign and non-sovereign interventions, documentation of value for money analysis was missing. Downstream activities, again, that's both sovereign and sovereign, non-sovereign, contributed to increased private sector participation in the provision of public infrastructure services. This is green, sustainable, resilient infrastructure and demonstration of PPP contractual viability, as well as increased adoption of new technology. In terms of ADB's organization for delivery, there is work to be done. Operational implementation of PPP strategy has often been uneven. And ADB often, when it looks at pillar four activities, ends up as a deal follower. The absence of an updated operational plan has concentrated staffing resources for PPPs often in transaction advisory services. This unit is a cost center and currently the measurement of its results in terms of mobilization and commercial close is inconsistent with those used at other MDBs. ADB support for PPPs has also not sufficiently leveraged some of ADB's core institutional strengths and a commitment to quality infrastructure outcomes and strategy 2030 goals. Very briefly, recommendations stretch between strategic, operational, and organizational. On the strategic recommendation, the report said that ADB should prepare a PPP directional guidance paper to include a strategic approach, an underlying theory of change, a reinforced results framework, and implementation guidelines that take into account the need for an increased focus on pillars one and two activity, an ex value anti addition in line with strategy 2030 operational priorities and quality infrastructure outcomes. Secondly, in terms of strategic recommendations, the report said that. ADB should strategically engage with DMC client governments from an early stage of project development, enhancing local capacity for screening and selection of projects, and look at an alternative financing modes, including official development assistance, PPPs, and using cost, benefit, and value for money analysis. In terms of operational recommendations, the report stated that ADB should seek to rapidly expand the use and scale of risk mitigation products to provide political risk and partial credit guarantees to facilitate private sector investment in PPP infrastructure projects. That also ADB should improve its monitoring and evaluation systems for PPP transactions to document outcomes across the entirety of the project cycle, covering long-term outcomes, early operating maturity, and moving beyond those and commercial close. In five, the, in terms of organizational recommendations, the report stated that ADB should operationally and organizationally separate the PPP thematic group from the Office of Public-Private Partnerships to strengthen this cross-institutional role and function to promote a holistic 1ADB approach to PPPs 
and alignment with quality infrastructure principles. And lastly, that ADB should assign the management of the AP3F, the Asia Pacific Project Preparation Facility, and other key donor and institutional relationships to the newly created PPP thematic group secretariat. Thank you very much. And handing back to Saleha at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And that was Alexander Velsteed. And he'll be around to answer any questions that you might have in the designated question and answer session. And uh, for those of you who are asking these questions, please place your questions in the chat box. For the panelists, um, as I announce your names, please turn your videos on. And uh, also in our endeavor to constantly evolve and to constantly better ourselves, uh, we are introducing a new section in what works, what doesn't and why. And Marvin will tell you a little bit more about what this section is, but let me just quickly introduce you to all the panelists and then you can get on with the show. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to A.D. Karen Murray, uh, OPP head, uh, Yoji Morishta, Bruno Carrasco, who's SDCC Director General, Christopher Thiem, DDG PSOD. And today's session, as always, will be moderated by DG IED Marvin Taylor Dotman. Marvin, it's over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Saleha, uh, Alex, uh, for a very succinct presentation of what the uh, report says. Thank you so much to all of you who are joining us. Uh, our discussion today is going to be composed of uh, three parts. Um, first, we're going to try to dig in into what actually happened over the last decade in uh, operations of uh, ADB in this space. Uh, we're going to make a pause. And as Aleja said, we're going to listen to voices from the field, uh, from our RMs some recorded uh, expressions, uh, reactions to uh, a, our colleagues from the field uh, on uh, a, their experience with operating in PPP. And then uh, we will talk uh, in the last part of our conversation of what, on what has to be done to address the issues that the evaluation and the experience of uh, the panelists uh, has demonstrated that need to be addressed. So that's the plan. Uh, and let us uh, then start uh, with uh, the first uh, part on trying to understand uh, what happened over the last uh, decade. Let me start first with Bruno. Uh, Bruno, the context obviously uh, it has changed in the, in the region. Uh, it goes without saying radically the development context. We are in the uh, midst of a crisis uh, right now. If we think of this context, uh, what, what is the strategic significance of uh, PPPs for the operations of the bank and for the region, uh, considering also uh, the circumstances that the region is going through, uh, most likely uh, a, the constraints, fiscal constraints that uh, the country will be facing, uh, the need for a rapid recovery. What, what is the role and the strategic significance of PPPs in what way they can help the accomplishment of the mission of the institution and at the same time, the development of the region? Well, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Marvin uh, and Saleha for uh, inviting me here again today. Uh, I find these events are fantastic to get the message out. So, Turning to your question, uh, Marvin, uh, let me begin by saying that uh, PPPs, as Alex has mentioned, uh, is very much a procurement option that can deliver services. And to the extent that it can serve to crowd in private investment, it does form part of the various infrastructure financing modalities that can contribute to ADB strategies to support infrastructure development and particularly address the large infrastructure gaps across Asia Pacific. However, we do feel that it is important to bear in mind a few points, and that is, uh, first, uh, PPPs are not a catch-all solution to all infrastructure development challenges, and the lesson here is to be selective on the type of projects that PPPs can help finance, uh, and this is linked to generation of income, revenue streams, etc. 
A second important point, and this is sometimes the one that uh, mystifies a lot of people, is that uh, PPPs should not be considered as a fiscal free lunch. Uh, so often, as, uh, as most people know, the fiscal liabilities uh, end up uh, hidden in the form of, of off-budget contingent liabilities. So this is an important consideration, even in the context of the shock that we're referring to. The C-19 shock, the COVID-19 shock, uh, and the resulting de decline in economic activity uh, will have certainly taken a large toll on PPPs by way of contracts that have or will be canceled or renegotiated. And we saw clear evidence of this uh, across countries during the global financial crisis. Now, it also follows that there is a, a general downward PPP global trend over the last 10 years, uh, ranging from about $55 billion in 2010 to $30 billion in 2019. So this is something that is a little bit of, a, of an early warning. Uh, we need to do better in terms of uh, promoting PPPs and, and, and looking at some of the issues that the IED report highlights uh, very clearly. Now, I think that um, to recover the role of PPPs um, and its importance in driving economic recovery, uh, we will have to work carefully on two fronts. And I think um, some of the work that we've done uh, together with uh, the OPPP uh, thematic group uh, suggests that um, from survey work, that there is um, uh, on the part of uh, government, uh, there is the question about the value for money proposition in PPPs, which you allude to or Alex alludes to in the report itself. Um, and, and in that sense, uh, you know, PPPs have to make a stronger uh, we have to have make a stronger case for PPPs on the value for uh, money comp proposition. Um, I think that that is combined with on the supply side where private parties tend to perceive a lack of flexibility uh, and risk sharing um, on the part of governments. And, and again, this comes to the very, very essence of PPP contracts. We also looked a little bit at the dispute resolution mechanisms, and uh, this will be very important also in promoting renegotiation of contracts in the context of this uh, C-19 shock. My second point here is that as the IED report highlights, you really reap what you sow and nurture. Um, so investing in upstream work, uh, public sector, helps certainly generate the downstream transactions that support the public and the private sectors. Um, however, this is not a, a one-off activity um, when it comes to investing in technical assistance for that pillar one on advocacy and, and capacity development. And I think it is important, and this is an important point that has been discussed, we need to develop the feedback mechanisms from pillars three on project development. Uh, we can see the, the transaction advisors, what is coming downstream and what has to be done better. And the way we can try to address that is providing some mechanism that allows for greater information flowing back to pillars one and two, and we can get to better downstream quality of, uh, of projects. I think I want to go back to 2010, 2012. At that time, I was in the SAPF. Uh, I think Anuj Mehta, if he's on the call, will recall. We would spend many, many uh, time and effort uh, working on technical assistance, in this case from the public sector, to help in the context of India, develop uh, a lot of TAs that would help, particularly in this pillar one, and to uh, helping develop capacity across uh, Ministry of Finance and line ministries, as well as across the states. So, so that is an example of, of a lot of the work that went in back then, and in some ways, we have uh, lost a little bit the direction in terms of that, that work. My very last point is that uh, in the context of uh, COVID-19, every dollar matters. Um, the IMF has come up with a publication titled Well Spent, where we see a lot of inefficiencies still generally in the whole uh, infrastructure uh, investment space. And I think it, it also applies, of course, uh, to PPPs, and we need to be better able to, to efficiently invest in infrastructure uh, as a way out of this crisis. To sum up, PPP work is fundamental to our ADB strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bruno, for setting the broader context. Uh, let, let, let me now uh, go to uh, Yoji. Yoji uh, obviously can react to many of the topics that uh, we have uh, on the table today. Uh, since you have been uh, leading the effort of the institution for uh, some some years now uh, in this area, but um, uh, let, let me ask you about a very specific type of a 
interventions that, that, that the bank and other multilaterals um, offer uh, in this space too. And this is this transactional advisory services uh, that are a fundamental component of uh, the, uh, the offerings, uh, as I said, of uh, MDBs, and uh, that have uh, uh, absorbed a lot of uh, the effort that you have been doing uh, in developing this line of business in the, in the bank. Uh, what, why are they so important? What, what is the role of a transactional uh, advisory services uh, in the context of uh, the support by NDBs uh, to, um, uh, to PPPs? What, what is the value addition of uh, this type of uh, uh, services? Uh, and and uh, what are your reactions, what, what the report says with respect to the way that these services have been working? And as I said, well developed by you over the last uh, four or five years. Okay, thank you, Marvin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you, ID colleagues, very much for giving me a chance to take part in this panel uh, discussion. I'm very excited to be here today. So now uh, the first question was why MDB uh, tend to provide public sector transactional advisory service called TAS. So let me start with the PPP principle. Almost of all DMCs tend to view private company as EPC contractor and or maintenance supplier in line with the traditional public investment. So even for standard ADB sovereign loans, these views remain the same. Because the DMC capacity to handle quality infrastructure is not so strengthened yet, because there is issue of sovereign fiscal capacity, as Bruno mentioned, and the PPP gain prominence as an alternative tool for procurement of quality infrastructure. And DMC should have leveraged private partners platform so then the DMC have to view private partner as project sponsor, developer, and operator, not simple APC contractor. And the private partner, together with private debt provider, can bring in high quality of people well beings with a reasonably long-term project cash flow. The, however, in reality, this PPP area is one that DMC are not most weak in understanding as a nature of public institutions. Therefore, DMC are willing to learn what is PPP, how to implement and monitor it. We ADB should support them. So why do DMC rely on uh, MDBs, multilateral development banks first? Three reasons among others. First, MDB have a long standing relationship and maintain strong trust with DMC governments, having served them for decades. Second, MDB strength is neutrality. And MDB is the best situated to provide advisory solution as an honest broker. Third, public sector advisory, particularly for Pathfinder project, were the first of a kind in a new sector in a new country takes huge time because of the need to teach as we go. The time and additional work often increase the cost, making it unprofitable venture. So this again makes MDBs the natural advisor to the governments because MDB has the patience to stay in the game. So why is value addition, uh, what is a value addition of task? So why you cannot see more PPPs despite the fact of its huge needs of infrastructure? The biggest reason is the lack of adequate project preparation and structuring. So PPPs are often not structured in a way that attract the interest of private partners, private investors, because the MC don't fully uh, know how and they don't have funds for it and there is no uh, meaningful enable environment. 
So uh, our office can address all these issues with other form of support from ADBs. So we support to conduct feasibility study, make a market sounding, conduct a tender and negotiate with a private partner on behalf of DMCs. And finally, bring private capital mobilization. By the way, uh, OPPP has mobilized private capital amounting to over US dollar 1 billion to date since I joined OPPP about three years ago. So uh, in terms of reaction to the issues identified by IED evaluation, I wanted to focus on one observation in particular, which is a need for ADB to focus more on upstream PPP activities, which we call pillar one, two in our four pillar framework. I couldn't agree more. And we are working to strengthen the upstream area by building a robust uh, PPP thematic group secretariat, which will be empowered soon to support delivering a bank-wide PPP agenda. So I am really excited about this because by combining our resources, we can have a much great, greater impact. And lastly, there is one thing I wanted to let you know. About eight years ago, ADB created the previous PPP operational plan as Alex mentioned, which was prepared in response to IED's then special evaluation study about PPPs. At the time, ADB provided some upstream and downstream supports, but crucial missing piece link was to project preparation and development. So as a result, project preparation, namely pillar three was included as one of the key pillars. Then the management had decided to establish office of PPP which was made in September, 2014. The point I wanted to make is that we are now happy to focus on efforts more on upstream PPP activities, but at the same time, we should ensure those upstream input will constantly bringing downstream output, namely project pipeline, opportunity of PPP preparation and private capital mobilization because we don't want IED to mention in 10 years that ADB should focus again on downstream pillar three and four instead of pillar one, two. So let me stop here. Thank you, thank you, Yoji. Thank you very much to put, for putting into context this very specialized service. We'll talk more about this work upstream, right? There are these two dimensions, upstream, downstream, uh, of uh, the work that the institution does in PPP. And uh, so we'll, we'll, we, we would like to hear more uh, from you about the upstream uh, work in the second part um, of our, uh, of our, of our uh, dialogue. But uh, let, let me now uh, bring in the perspective of one of the piece of uh, the PPP, the private sector part. Uh, in, in our evaluation, for those of you who um, read it, and those of you who did not, uh, we report that uh, pr the private sector part of uh, the three the, the three piece did very well, it performed well, and it also contributed um, a, to good results uh, in the region. So, Chris, uh, let me bring you uh, a, here to the dialogue and. Perhaps you can explain to us what, what were the reasons behind this success? What explains this? And uh, in what way can this be replicated? Uh, in, uh, were there any missing areas of interventions, opportunities that uh, were not well uh, taken advantage of at the regional level, some places that you could have done uh, more or uh, or at the sectoral level, some sectors that require more interventions uh, from the private sector perspective. Chris, thank you very much, Marvin. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone from the Manila headquarters building. Um, in case you feel homesick, I could take you for a tour <laughs> if you'd like to stay on after the, after the panel. We can see you from our offices. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so uh, uh, first, on uh, Marvin, on your side, you know, thank you for this report. It was a very rich in content, very um, 
uh, comprehensive and so uh, very much uh, informs operations going forward. Many, many important observations come from this report. Um, it's a pleasure to stand next to the 91% success uh, rating, a uh, somewhat unusual situation for, for private sector operations to be um, commended in this way. So um, I, I'm not sure if it's fully deserved, um, but uh, anyway, pleasure for me to um, uh, address uh, an audience um, next to this particular success factor, which of course was um, uh, the product of hard work over a 10 year period. Um, so to your question, Marvin, uh, first, you know, what were, what were, from my perspective, some of the drivers of success that, that led to this type of uh, result? Um, so several factors come to mind. One, one is, um, you know, people. So the, uh, one of the major drivers of success for us is we have actually been able to assemble a very, very solid team of transactionally competent project finance people in particular uh, that to, to help address this PPP space. We also have um, a, a rich set of partners within the bank, including colleagues from OPPP, SDCC and, and others to work with to help strengthen and, and uh, inform our operations. So um, the quality of people also um, should, I think I should underline one additional point, which is, you know, there's a lot of discussion about uh, so-called bankable projects. And um, one of the observations I have that I'd like to share is a project, the projects that we engage are not bankable when, when they kind of, you know, if they walk in the door or when we first come across them, they're, they're bankable after we've engaged them. And, and those engagements oftentimes result in potentially hundreds of hours of negotiation, reworking of things, um, significant uh, arm wrestling with sponsors to find commercially acceptable solutions. And a lot of that takes place in, uh, without a lot of minuting. Um, so there's a bit of opacity to that particular activity. But um, I would just, again, can wish for an understanding that what might sometimes look like a bankable project when we're done with it, or what is a bankable project when we're done with it, um, required a tremendous amount of work in the tool shop um, and, and kind of the workshop floor. So that's, that's one kind of thing. And then we have the right people across ADB to help engage and, and kind of perfect that work. And I think that's what's led to um, the success factor. Another matter is um, uh, knowledge. So one of some of the data that appeared in the report said that um, there were $224 million of technical assistance provided for projects that were under the survey of this report and that the private sector operations uh, provided $11.1 .1 billion of project uh, investment, either in debt and equity. That's a two percent, roughly a 2% technical assistance to investment ratio. And uh, you know that technical assistance helps us in, in two directions. It helps us strengthen the upstream components of a project, but it also helps us infuse more development impact on the downstream side. So technical assistance kind of has two, the kind of two facets of upstream and enhancement of upstream and also um, enhancement of, of the quality of development impacts that can be achieved downstream, both of which are really essential to what we're doing. So um, I think, again, our ability as an institution to infuse, to use technical assistance and to infuse knowledge is one of the drivers of the positive results. Another factor is courage. So, um, you know, we're faced in these, in these PPP operations with uh, a need to accept risk, to know when to accept risk, and to have the uh, courage to basically know when uh, to proceed and when, when to not proceed. Um, a, a short and anecdotal story, um, I joined ADB 10 years ago, which was almost exactly the, you know, the beginning of the term of this report. And one of the first projects we financed was a solar project, which we're doing routinely in 2021. But in 2010, it was the first large scale solar project being done as a PPP in Asia. And uh, we need, we hired, we, we did, we uh, took a classical approach to the financing of that project. But at the time, some, some of you will be sensitive to this kind of data point, but that project uh, required a 25 cent per kilowatt hour tariff. And just to put that in proportion, that's about six times what the tariff would be in the current environment. But financing a project that was premised on a technology that was that off of the um, lowest cost kind of curve does require some courage. And so 
I think it was a reflection that we had at the time is we felt like we were financing technologies that were similar to those large um, calculators that I had when I was a teenager. I don't know how, how, I'm sure we have various ages of people on the phone, but we felt like we were financing a project that with the passage of time would look a little bit um, obsolete, like a, a Jurassic technology, you know, with the passage of time. So having the courage and having the judgment to know when a strategic agenda is of such importance that it needs to, to proceed is, um, is something I, again, I think um, uh, very, would, would very rightly tab as being something that requires courage. Um, lastly, I think, you know, tools. So um, just to call out a couple of tools we've, that have been important to our success, uh, our treasury department has been very helpful in uh, uh, providing um, local currency lending capabilities. So the PPP agenda has one that has kind of um, um, evolved into um, a local, a locally financed, uh, locally sponsored market. And our ability to work with our treasury colleagues has allowed EDB to become a, essentially a local bank providing local currency solutions. And that's allowed us to move with the changes in the market. Uh, but there have been a lot of, a lot of um, impacts because of the kind of migration from a kind of international US dollar based uh, political risk insurance uh, using type configuration for PPPs and then moving um, into local markets where risk appetites can vary. So I'm not sure, Marvin, if I've maybe used up my consumption of time, but maybe, <laughs> yes, yeah. we, we, we will. We, we, thank you very much, uh, Chris. We will be able to come back to some of these topics, hopefully, in the second part uh, of the conversation. There are two very interesting questions that uh, I hope you're all reading. One, one specifically that uh, is, is addressing uh, the points that uh, Yoshi made about transaction, transactional advisory services. Why do we have to do this on non-competitive basis? Uh, why the bank uh, offers this, this technical assistance uh, uh, and not compete with other companies that are offering these services there in the market. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, this, th this other interesting question too about working at the sub-regional level, sub-national level, uh, I mean to say, right? Uh, that what are the challenges, revenue generation at that level, uh, given the fact that the governments cannot tax at the, at the, at the regional uh, level? Uh, procurement practices. And so please uh, keep these questions there uh, for the second half as if you can, you can uh, fold in your answers uh, in the second uh, half of the conversation. Thank you very much for those who are asking these questions. And let me now bring the perspective uh, from a board member. Um, and Karen, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, so uh, what, what, do you think about the role of PPPs for the development of uh, the region? And more importantly, what do you think about the work that the bank has done over the last decade uh, in promoting PPPs in the region? Has the bank been offering uh, a service to its fullest potential um, in where it is needed? especially to develop what we now call quality infrastructure in the region. Um, thanks very much, Mar uh, Marvin, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I also want to just briefly um, start by complimenting the IED team. Um, this was an excellent and a really comprehensive evaluation on an important topic. It was very well received by the board um, when it was discussed at the DEC last year in October. Um, and I think it's been particularly timely in the context of, of COVID-19. Um, my constituency also received um, really good coverage in the evaluation, um, which reflects that many of our members, both big and small, um, have all benefited from ADB's support for PPPs. Um, in terms of the role of PPPs for the region, um, just to be very brief on this, um, uh, there's a, a clear need for private investment. And I agree there's a critical role for well-designed PPPs um, that deliver value for money. But uh, designing PPPs that actually deliver value for money is actually quite hard. Um, the long lives of PPPs are both their strength and also um, they're probably their biggest weakness. 
Um, and there's very good reasons why PPPs are not universally loved or trusted. Um, and as Bruno mentioned already, uh, they can generate really huge contingent uh, liabilities for, um, for DMCs. Um, I thought the, the DMC PPP readiness in the evaluation was very useful. Um, and it showed that the impediments to growing the use of successful PPPs remain very high. Um, one of the things that was slightly surprising for me from the evaluation um, is not just the, the scale of the challenge in the enabling environment, um, but the negative trends that we saw in, in many countries over the 2010 to 2018 period that was used, and particularly when it came to the enforceability of, of legal contracts, which is so critical for PPPs. So this brings me to ADB's overall development impact and, and where we, whether we've really contributed um, where it matters. Um, I won't rehash the findings Alex already outlined at the, at the beginning, um, but just to say from my perspective, um, it is a problem because um, I see it as ADB not playing to its true comparative advantage. Um, MDBs generally have a unique opportunity to be a truly trusted advisor to DMC governments, and Yoji highlighted this also. Um, I think ADB has a further advantage over some uh, other MDBs, both being of the region, the deep relationships and, and presence, and also being able to operate as a single integrated organization about, uh, across both sovereign and non-sovereign. Um, so PPPs to me is an area where a genuine integrated one ADB approach is needed um, and can make a really transformational difference. So I think what came through the evaluation is that the operational plan actually said many of the right things about the need to provide an integrated and holistic approach. Um, but it was our implementation of that that went off track um, in terms of the balance of what we focused on and, and how we set ourselves up for delivery. Having said that, um, I do want to say that everyone who's worked on a successful PPP transaction, either structuring or financing, should be really proud of your work. Um, these are highly complex deals in, in challenging environments and they make a positive difference. So some individual transactions can have a very significant catalytic impact um, as Chris has already outlined. So the downstream work does have its place, but um, as an organization, I think we need to aim for that more transformational role. And we need to move away from following deals more opportunistically towards more emphasis on, on creating the environment for PPP opportunities to grow across the region. Um, I think it sounds like there's resounding agreement already among the panel um, and also with the management response that we need to focus more on the upstream work. Um, I think the main focus of ADB needs to be on developing the capacity in DMCs so that they're aware of the risks, they're trying to manage those risks and to bring, for ADB to bring the best practices from countries that already have good experience. Uh, so overall, I think good acceptance and understanding of where we need to refocus strategically, but we do need to ask ourselves hard questions about how we ensure we deliver on our um, intentions next time and not overcorrect as Yoji already highlighted. Thank you very much, Karen. Great. Uh, I very much appreciate a very compact um, uh, perspective. Um, let, let us hear from the field now before we go into our second part of our conversation. The ID evaluation recommended that we need to do more on the enabling environment for PPPs. But I think this needs to be extended to sector reform and state on enterprise reform. For example, in the energy sector, we cannot have successful PPPs if we do not have a sound regulatory framework for the energy sector and commercially oriented utilities, which are typically state owned. I very much agree with the recommendation that it is important to engage early with governments. For example, um, the National Solar Park in Cambodia has shown that the early engagement with SCRD when they discussed with the government about a loan for a solar park and then introducing OPPP has led to a very competitive procurement of solar energy. PSOD has also uh, joined this 1ADB effort and provided a package of long-term financing, a whole syndication with um, commercial banks and bilaterals and IFC as well, to the sponsors uh, to give them confidence to bid very low pricing because they know long-term financing is available. This um, led to a, a 3.88 cents per kilowatt hours, which is very competitive um, compared to uh, uh, previous um, uh, procurement of renewable energy. 
and this early engagement has then helped the early engagement with other countries such as Vietnam and Myanmar, which have heard about this success and wanted to talk uh, to ADB uh, about how to structure a solar park as well. I would uh, stress two recommendations from the report. One is the early on strategic engagement uh, with the uh, government DMCs uh, on PPPs. And second is uh, to promote really uh, one ADP approach uh, in PPPs. In this respect, uh, as, as a potential next step, uh, uh, we could consider empowering in a meaningful way RMs uh, through uh, establishing a, a PPP function in resident missions uh, so that they can be uh, the real frontliners for PPP work on the ground to implement those two recommendations, strategic early on engagement and one ADB approach. Uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, to our colleagues from the field. Uh, your perspective are well uh, recognized and uh, we appreciate uh, uh, your, your views. We will continue doing this, bringing perspective from the field. Um, let, let us now uh, bring the conversation home uh, with thinking about the future. What has to be uh, done going forward uh, and, and please remember that there are uh, 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 some questions there that have been posed. Two that I mentioned. Try to fold in your answers within within them uh, if you if you call, if you can. I would refer quickly to one of them of how we evaluate uh, private sector operations. And let me uh, let me first uh, start with the second part uh, about the conversation uh, by bringing in uh, Chris again on what has to be done going forward. The evaluation call for uh, the uh, use of uh, uh, appropriate instruments uh, going forward, like risk mitigation product, products, blended finance, third party, more use of third party uh, capital mobilization, all fundamental um, uh, instruments for you to operate, especially from the pri private sector uh, side. So your reactions to uh, what uh, the evaluation is, is saying in this respect, given, again, the conditions that countries will be facing uh, with, with the, the recovery from the COVID-19 economic crisis. Chris? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again. <clears throat> Uh, so the comments that were made in the report about uh, credit enhancement products were, you know, caused us really to spend a lot of time kind of reflecting on that. Um, the, as I had just mentioned in the closing part of my comments before, we've seen a lot of PPPs kind of migrating into local markets with local sponsors and being financed in local currency. Uh, that has been a factor in a reduction in some of the demand that we have for credit enhancement products because quite often local players don't require political risk insurance in the jurisdictions that they call home. Um, so, uh, but but that's, not, that's not the complete story. So another element where I think we really took on that advice and, and feel it was very important, we really touched on two places. One was um, clearly we have a strategic priority in terms of doing more in, in fragile conflict affected states, FCAS states and SIDS in the, in the in small island developing uh, situations. So in both of those cases, I think we, we really took the recommendations to heart that we should find new tools and new configurations and push value added products more into um, those activities. That uh, in terms of operationalizing that advice that we received, we also realized that working more closely with our colleagues in OPPP would be a key part of that so that these products could be kind of uploaded into what OPPP then used to credit enhance and, and, and uh, take projects to tendering phase. So there was a lot of overlap between the advice we received from IED saying that we should be using, strategically using these types of credit enhancement project products um, and then a realization that that really um, is something that 
we should do and that it should be for the benefit of more upstream work in order to strengthen that upstream work. Those, those were some of the takeaways that we had. And then we've, we've acted on it. So we've, uh, in the middle of last year, um, uh, created a Pacific Renewable Energy Program, which amongst other things uh, really uh, provides donor support for very, very sculpted interventions, which really apply to OPPP activities more than say PSOD activities, but they are available to both um, pillar three and pillar four activities. And there's also been uh, a lot of support from our shareholders for something called private sector window, which came out of the ADF uh, discussions, which also uses, uh, provides a very, very creative uh, set of new tools, including things like local currency capability in currencies that might um, not have uh, liquid local markets where we might need to use non-traditional approaches to deliver, um, for example, an, uh, uh, a financing that might be denominated in Afghan currency, for example. It wouldn't be commercially readily available to our treasury colleagues, but this particular product can help us deliver a very, very value-added piece of, of, uh, of new product. So those are the, re those are the reflections that we've had um, very, very valuable advice. And, and I think we're, again, intending to operationalize those uh, specific comments um, going forward. So thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, let me, again, going forward, uh, bring in Bruno. One of the things that, uh, that uh, the evaluation indicates is that the bank needs to exercise thought leadership uh, that uh, it has not done uh, very well in this area. Uh, someone is asking uh, as well uh, whether the bank has the appropriate resources to, to do that. Do, does it have the human, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about human resources to, to do this? Perhaps you can fold in in your very short uh, response to a complex question. Uh, what do you think about this, right? And, uh, and what is the bank going to go, do going forward and what's the role of SDCC in this respect? Okay, thank you very much, Marvin, for that question. It's a, it's a hard question. I think if you look at uh, SDCC, what is it that we can contribute? Uh, well, it'd be three things, knowledge, uh, innovation, and partnership and collaboration. We've got seven operational priorities under SDCC. We've got 14 sector and thematic chiefs. And now with uh, the PPP thematic group, uh, although the reporting line is directly to the head of OPPP, there is a second reporting line to the director general of SDCC. I think that opens up a, a lot of opportunities in terms of uh, many areas. But one that I would like to very much focus on is the, the cross-cutting side of things. Uh, we need to be better in terms of combining thematic and sector work. I think one of the, 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 the great things about uh, the PPP work is that it can accommodate itself to, to many different uh, development challenges and, and working closely with uh, the other sector and even thematic uh, chiefs, I think there, there are a lot of synergies that, uh, that can be developed effectively. Um, the, the partnership and collaboration, I think that's important because uh, as 180B, as was mentioned before in this conversation, um, we need to be able to develop stronger linkages uh, between the work that we're doing and the work that the, uh, the regional departments, the operational departments are doing. And that is really done through this thematic and sector committees. So, so so bringing a lot of uh, that thinking together would be would be very important. I think the capacity development side, as was mentioned uh, among a number of panelists, that that is very critical. Uh, trying to link up a little bit with one of the questions on subnational uh, PPPs. Uh, clearly, capacity constraints are a, a key issue. If it's already uh, difficult in some national at the national level, it's it's magnified at the subnational level. We need to also look at uh, ways of bringing in more commercial assets uh, the commercial orientation of activities being done at the subnational level if we can get those things right I think we can start doing a little bit more PPPs at the subnational level. I know that the uh, the liv livable cities work uh, that is is being pursued is looking at uh, bringing a little bit more of that commercial orientation, and I think that would be very important. Um, so let me stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, very very again compact. Uh, uh, in in Yoji, uh, now let me bring bring you in now. Um, 
you already referred to the need for to 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 work engage um, uh, upstream with, with with countries. So, in the interest of time, let me ask you a fundamental question here that the co the, the evaluation is is referring to. How do how are we going to uh, institutionally uh, promote a one ADB approach uh, in 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 the bank and especially in PPP that can is by definition is is an area that demands one ADB approach. What are your plans? How is OPPP going to promote this uh, one ADB approach to deliver PPPs? Okay, thank you, Marvin. You know, before I answer the question, I saw some question regarding why uh, OPPP can be entered into competitive bidding and then why you, you are the cost center. That sort of question mm -hmm. I just saw. So before I talk about uh, your question, I think I wanted to answer the question. So the uh, people have to recognize there is difference between financial advisor to the private sector and transaction advisor for the public sectors, right? So financial advisor to the you know, private sector, the purpose is to uh, arrange the debt uh, portion, you know, make a debt arrangement as well as uh, maximizing return on equity for the sponsors. And then, but, you know, transaction advisor service for public sector purpose is completely different to identify, you know, private sectors. Uh, with a reasonable, uh, you know, uh, transparent uh, uh, accountabilities. So this is a big difference. And then we don't want to, you know, uh, crowd out the, you know, private consultant and commercial banks for the financial advisor sector. And then we, I don't want to make a financial advisor for the private sector. But for the, you know, transactional advisor service for public sector, it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's very difficult to, you know, make a time management and cost management also. Okay, so then, um, and then because of the high project preparation cost, making OPPP a profit center would compromise on its ability to create a development impact. So OPPP aims for partial cost recovery, and this is consistent with IFC and EBRD, the closest to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, comparable mm -hmm. in terms of business model. So that's my answer to the question. And then going Thank back you. to your question mm -hmm. uh, regarding, you know, how can we be more proactive in terms of early engagement? So first, building awareness. We need to increase awareness of PPPs within central government and the line agencies. We have a tool for that for this, the PPP certificate program. Mm -hmm. And we have already deployed in, in, the, in the several of our DMC clients. Okay. And second, integration of PPP into infrastructure planning. So we still see PPPs mostly happening on an ad hoc basis, which does focus on systematic pipeline development, project screening, and value for money. So while we have been instilling this uh, principle mm -hmm. into many of our clients, through our constant dialogue, it needs to be implemented at a more structural level. So OPPP TG Secretariat will support creating development PPP roadmap for countries and work with RDs to incorporate these into CPS process in a one db fashions. So this is something we are already doing in Mongolia and Bangladesh, and we hope to do in more countries. I think we are the, at the limit of our time. I know, I know that there are the, uh, a, a number of things that uh, you uh, in SDCC are, are doing to promote a 180B approach uh, and also with private sector. Um, but I would, I would um, uh, encourage the participants to direct your questions. There are some questions that are not being responded here because of time constraint, direct your questions to the panelists. I'm sure that they will all respond to you directly. It doesn't matter what level of uh, the staff is, direct your questions to them. They are the kind and, and, and knowledgeable uh, panelists and I'm sure that they will respond uh, to you uh, in writing. Uh, and, and let me uh, uh, turn the floor 
uh, to Karen to have the last word as a member of the board. Uh, as a member of the board, what are your expectations about uh, the actions that management is going to take to improve the delivery of uh, PPPs and mm -hmm. uh, to be better aligned with uh, what Strategy 2030 is indicating? And what would you consider success uh, if everything goes well? Last word from you, uh, Karen. Uh, thanks, Marvin. Um, and I am conscious of time, so I'll try and keep this uh, relatively brief. Um, as I already said, I think there's um, some pretty good acceptance of some of the changes that, that need to be made. And I was pretty pleased with the management response um, that we had last year. Um, in terms of uh, what I'd like to see in the directional paper that's um, being prepared at the moment, um, I think we probably need to change our offering in practice um, and the balance rather than the, the words necessarily of, of the four pillars. Um, so three areas that um, I just want to highlight. Um, the first I've already talked about, which is um, that our support for PPPs has got to be grounded in our comparative advantage. Um, I think we need to build and, and communicate our offering um, of PPP support um, around that. So there's no doubt to our DMCs that we are their trusted advisor and that we're always acting in their best interests. Um, I don't think that we'll maximize our effectiveness or our impact if there are concerns or perceptions of conflict of interest. Um, so the evaluation highlighted a number of areas that we need to, to think through in that respect. Um, and I know there were slightly different views between IED and management on, on how to resolve those. Um, the second area is um, about a country-led approach and Strategy 2030 commits us um, to taking a country-led approach. So I think it's really important that we tailor our thinking and our advice um, to uh, each of our members' context and ensure that we're sensitive to how that context is evolving. Um, I think that's particularly cri critical in the, um, with PPPs because the success of PPPs does depend on the country context. Political and social factors are really critical to take into account in PPP design. Um, and as a result of COVID, I think we've um, already seen some shifts of norms and the permission space um, in the political, social and economic context. Some of the underlying issues and, and fragilities with how public services are provided and funded um, have been exposed. And I think there's a much greater recognition of uh, the need um, for resilience and the critical role that governments play. Um, and I think that has been a shift. So I think we need to ensure that um, we're in tune with the context in each of our countries um, and what that might mean for um, identifying and designing appropriate long-term PPP arrangements um, because they rely on that political commitment and support um, over decades. Um, we had a question on resourcing and, and that was something that I did want to touch on as well. Um, so in terms of resourcing this work, um, management are never allowed to say that more resources are needed, um, but I would certainly say that to deliver on the, I can do it for you, uh, to deliver on the ambitions um, that have been sort of signed up to and agreed with uh, the, the evaluation, it's very clear to me that a higher level of resourcing um, is going to be needed and just um, shifting the balance of staff between um, the transaction advisory services to upstream work, that's just not going to, to be sufficient. Um, so I think we also need to think about um, a higher level, not just a higher level of resourcing, but the balance of staff versus consultants and short versus long term consultants and, and TAs. Um, I think this is really, really important in this area. If we're looking to work closely with governments as a trusted advisor, um, I think there needs to be a, more of a bias towards using staff and, and longer term consultants. Um, I did want to touch on uh, the Pacific Private Sector Development Initiative, and it was good to see um, uh, Eric on the screen before. Um, the, the PSDI was profiled in the report, um, and it's something that I'm very familiar with. And I think it offers an excellent model for thinking about our support for PPPs um, and our, our knowledge work more generally. It's demand driven. Um, the consultants deeply understand the context and they are on long term contracts. They build relationships with counterparts. It also covers SOE reform, PPPs, competition policy, access to finance, business law reform, and women's empowerment. Um, so one of the things highlighted in the evaluation was the need to take a much more integrated approach um, and really think about how SOE reform and you know, the, the sector reforms um, complement the, the PPP reforms. Um, so I think we need to look really creatively at how we resource this um, and that also goes to the institutional arrangements and and how it's all structured and um, so I, I thought that was an important question that was raised earlier um, and I would like to see management be um, quite creative and, and give serious thought to 
um, how to make that 180B approach uh, work in practice in, in the context of PPPs and go beyond the, the status quo organizational structure. Um, I did have some points around um, fee recovery for uh, transaction advisory services, which Yoji has somewhat answered, but I think that's um, a minor one that we'll pick up offline. So back to you. Thanks, Marvin. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, when we have these conversations, time is never on our side um, to cover so much ground that uh, we intend to cover. What I think our panelists uh, have done a fantastic job uh, to cover the ground. So let's give them a big round of uh, applause. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, if you notice, our audience has still uh, has stayed with us. Um, it, it, we still have a large number of uh, participants uh, with us in the seminar. We thank you very much for your for your uh, patient uh, and uh, your interest uh, uh, on this topic and all the topics that we we bring to your your attention through these events. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Orishita San. Uh, thank you, Karen. Thank you, uh, Bruno. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Great contributions. And have everyone a nice evening, nice day, nice, a nice afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Thank you very much. <laughs>